Burning Shores does everything it needs to do as an addendum to Horizon Forbidden West. It acts as a very nice, very tidy, and very well executed epilogue chapter, and that makes it strong in the execution of its intent. But at the same time, it's no more than that. It doesn't really manage to totally outclass the Frozen Wilds in scope and scale, and part of that leaves me feeling partially underwhelmed. If the Frozen Wilds was Horizon's Hearts of Stone, I expected Burning Shores to be their blood and wine, but it isn't that. And that's fine, doesn't make it bad, it's actually really very good for a multitude of reasons, but I think it's important to establish that I did feel underwhelmed at first. However, it slowly began to hit me what this DLC was doing, what the focus truly was, and how deeply well executed it is. Over the days since I finished the main story, it's only gone up in my estimations. It's been some time since I've critiqued a piece of DLC. The last time was uh, God of War Ragnarok. <laughs> I'm joking. The last time I did so on release of the DLC was the Perilon Gorgon DLC for The Outer Worlds, which I'm sure you all remember, as it is the most viewed video on YouTube. It has a hundred, hundred bazillion views. I don't check. But that leaves me in an interesting spot, because this isn't a thing I usually do. I don't usually critique DLCs. I sort of leave them and, and just play them. But Horizon is one of the very, very few franchises out there from a AAA developer that never fails to engage me. You could call me a shill, but... I'd say that I'm justifiably smitten with this IP. That opening bit maybe made me sound like I actually thought the DLC kind of sucked, which is absolutely not the case, but I did want to establish that I did feel the DLC felt a little bit lacking in ambition in a lot of areas, a little bit reserved, and that could be because of the finale of the DLC pulling out all of the stops and maybe their entire budget went into that, but that said, what the DLC's purpose is, is character, the same as Forbidden West. It's touching on and developing into Aloy's sense of self after the events of Forbidden West. Who is she now she's truly embraced what it means to be different from Elizabeth? And I think it's really done to great effect. Of course, these videos are all about going into every aspect of the subject matter, and so full spoilers in this video for Burning Shores. However, I will separate them in chapters, so we'll talk major story moments and character beats later, and I'll discuss world, gameplay, side content, and general vibe first. These videos aren't intended to be reviews so much as an analysis of how I found the game to be. But I still like to keep spoilers out of the general discussion of brand new releases, unless the video is specifically about that topic, like it was with... Ragnarok. Before we begin as well, I'd like to say a big thank you to Sony for providing me with a review code of Burning Shores. Receiving free stuff never alters how I view a thing. Feel free to ask Volition to vouch for me on that one. Once they get out of the hospital. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, let's jump into Horizon Forbidden West, Burning Shores. I'm sorry about that, that probably sounded horrific. <laughs> the thing that remains solidly the same is the gameplay. Of course, this is an expansion, and so the way the game plays won't alter. It's still as solid as I found it to be on release, and it hasn't aged in that regard. Some games can and often do start to feel out of date, even a year after release, but Horizon still feels as solid and as engaging as ever, with all the same praise I gave to it in my original video. Everybody who has ever said that Horizon plays badly or is boring, you're wrong. I, I won't elaborate. The places where we find the most changes, however, is in how gameplay seems to be implemented into level design, as well as some new additions that I think alter the way you sometimes approach combat and navigation. The way you climb, for example, remains unchanged, but far more often the game encourages ejecting from your current hanging position to reach a beam or a wall behind you. It's not deep and it's incredibly simple, but it's a feature that feels incredibly kinetic and gives the illusion of depth to movement because no longer are you simply pushing in a direction and sometimes hitting the jump button to cross large gaps, you're engaging in a way that forces you to make the choice to unlock from your magnetized and safe position on a wall or a ledge and dive backwards into the hopes of grabbing hold of something just across a gap behind you. It's obviously nowhere near as useful and consistent a move as it is in something like the original Assassin's Creed games, but it's something that just adds a slight layer of depth to a system that originally had near to none at all, allowing for level design to take advantage of the gameplay in a way that causes it to feel ever so slightly more like you're the one doing the thing 
thing rather than being passive while linear climbing simply happens in front of you. There are also moments which call for you to use a ballista to shoot handholds into cliff faces for companions or for yourself to climb higher, which I thought was really nice. I like interactions with the environment in order to create a method of progression. It's small, but it's nice. Doing more of this could be something to consider in the next game to make puzzles and challenge areas have that bit more substance that parts of Horizon severely need. Movement shouldn't be an automatic means to an end, it should be an integral part of gameplay, and if you're going to have climbing, then you need to have a reason for me to engage with climbing, rather than just pushing a direction and tapping a button. Uncharted remedied this by having the, the, the little knife thing that you jam into the wall sometimes, which, while not being a major thing, at least, you know, I have to think about it, as well as having differing and altering paths and the grapple hook, which, you know, means you actually have to think about where you're swinging to. Horizon could maybe do with a little bit more of that, combining elements from Uncharted and maybe some from the old Assassin's Creed games to allow that just added bit of player agency and decision making. Horizon could deeply improve with a focus on these systems. In the first game, you could only climb certain areas. In the sequel, you could scale entire cliff faces. And in the DLC, they use the system they have to allow the player to feel more in control. With added features to the system and maybe slightly better snap block targeting so I don't keep throwing Aloy into the ground at terminal velocity, you could see something that would actually be an incredibly engaging way to move through levels. I'm not saying it needs to be as complex as something like the original Assassin's Creed games because of course parkour was a core pillar of their gameplay, but I am also picturing Aloy navigating an old world ruin like it's an Ezio trilogy tomb and frothing at the mouth, so maybe that is what I'm asking for in the end. Coupled with climbing is the introduction of water shoots that spurt out of the floor in particular areas, and using the shield wing can be used to throw Aloy high into the air. And I'm pretty sure this is stolen right out of Breath of the Wild, same as the shield wing itself. Although to be fair, despite Breath of the Wild making this an iconic feature, it has been used in games prior, so it's not like Breath of the Wild invented it, although they definitely stole it from Breath of the Wild. This feature is Fuck, this feature is sometimes a little bit janky. I found myself pretty often overshooting or undershooting or just completely flying my face into the side of a building. I think the main issue with Horizon's movement system for gliding and climbing and even running around to an extent is the fact it's kind of imprecise, yet tries to have you execute precise things. It's an issue similar to the movement system in The Witcher 3, which I criticised in one of those videos, uh, somewhere. But the difference being in The Witcher, it doesn't often make you land on small platforms where you're forced to perfectly balance your character as to not fall and screw up entirely. Or having to figure out whether the beam in front of you is one she'll auto jump to if you just move forward towards it, or whether you need to do a small little hop manually to latch onto it, and you'll probably still miss it anyway. I did talk about this in the original Forbidden West video, but it's something Horizon needs to work on. The most important thing I'd wager, because the combat, the atmosphere, storytelling, and everything else is always very strong, but the movement system and how it's implemented leaves a lot to be desired. And although this is stuff that all applies to the base game, the reason I'm mentioning it again is because they clearly take steps here to rectify these issues. It's very clear they want to make it more engaging, and often I found myself seeing that they were trying to make sure they had a safety net for you so that you didn't mess up in these situations because they seem somewhat aware that the system isn't totally reliable, which leads me to believe that maybe in the third entry we're going to have a much better movement system for climbing and for generally just getting around. On the same hand, we have a new mount, the Water Wing, the distant cousin of the Sun Wing, that's only difference is the ability to dive below water. It's used once in a mission to avoid incoming fire, and beyond that serves no purpose and is never useful again. It slows your movement to a crawl, and often the water is too shallow for it to even be fun visually. It feels like an idea that was half-baked and underused. The initial first time pulling it off feels flashy and cool, but after that, it's a whole lot of nothing, and that's a shame. A small tweak I might have made would be to allow a speed boost when exiting the water on a successful dive. If you stay under for the right time and swoop in the correct curve, coming back above the waves should allow the bird a short boost in speed to encourage exploration of the diving to better aid efficient navigation. But as it stands, it's a fun little move at best, and a poorly implemented gimmick at worst. Combat seems to be something they've remedied in areas where it needed it most. One of my biggest criticisms of Forbidden West is that the Zenith machines felt pretty underwhelming and borderline boring to fight against, with them not having the complexity of regular machines, with the many different and intricate components with which to exploit. Instead, the Spectres simply have plating which you'd shoot off one by one, usually after inflicting them with acid damage and then simply rinse and repeat until they were defeated. You do fight Spectres in this DLC, but nowhere near as much as you do in Forbidden West's main game. 
Instead, the game actually often reverts to the usage of the far more interesting corruptors from Zero Dawn, as Londra creates more of them using the Horus. This, along with the other instance of attempted correction, the Zenith Defense Drone, which is a Zenith machine with a little bit more complexity than a Spectre, needing you to navigate around it in order to destroy the cause, a little more than band-aiding a larger issue that will likely be rectified in the third entry. I appreciate what they've done allows for slightly more engaging combat when going up against the tougher Zeniths, but rather than making the Spectres more fun to fight, they've just removed them from the equation in most instances, instead reverting back to what worked in Zero Dawn. While I understand this and actually think it was a clever use of the story context to allow for it to happen, it does feel like something they're doing quickly now to properly address in the future, and that fills me with confidence because they identified that the Spectres were somewhat boring as an enemy type to fight and decided the best course of action for now was to simply stop using them so frequently and tag in other machines instead to make the gameplay more enjoyable in important story moments. And We'll talk about the big one later, I can assure you. All that said though, the defense drone is still pretty shallow, with it just sort of sitting there whilst you move around it shooting the same three cores, and given the Zenith story is concluded, I suppose we may never get to see an interesting and perfected Zenith machine that feels as fun to fight as regular machines are, which is a bit of a shame, but at least it shouldn't be an issue moving into the third game. There is an interesting addition with regards to the Zeniths, however, something the pre-release material did somewhat spoil, that being the Spectre Gauntlet. Yeah. This gauntlet can be fired whilst gliding and has two different attack modes, one that comes from collecting it within the main story, the other which comes from completing a side quest. I was concerned that this might prove to be far too overpowered and completely fuck with the balancing of combat, but it doesn't actually, it's a really nice addition. The first fire mode is the shard barrage, which allows Aloy to fire explosive shards at a moderate pace. Because it takes a while to charge itself to full fire speed and it's incredibly inaccurate, it can be a risk to start firing it, because enemies have the chance to knock you off balance balance, deal damage, or just move out of the way entirely. You can use a marker with R1 that have the shards sort of vaguely follow the target, which is definitely a useful addition, meaning you're far more likely to deal damage, although this comes at the cost of stamina. The second fire mode is the railgun, which, uh... Well, it's, it's a railgun. It shoots a beam at an enemy after a small charge-up period, and it does deal a hefty bit of damage. The trade-off here, though, really is the charge-up time. Even though it's not that long, it does leave you open to an attack, for enough time that I often did get fucked up by trying to rely too heavily on the railgun, which I think makes it a well-balanced tool. As well, it also has a tiny reticle, so you'll have to be accurate. All of this allows for the Spectre Gauntlet to be a worthy addition to Aloy's arsenal that you don't feel too heavily reliant on and still allows value to the faster and more accurate bows, which is a huge win. Although I did find myself still falling back on the explosive spear thrower, which desperately needs to be nerfed because it honestly is sort of game-breakingly powerful as fun as I do find it. Stealth, I said in my original video, is not really how you ever play Horizon. It's more a means from which you assess a scenario and then enter combat, which is still true of the machines, but I feel I neglected to discuss how it actually functions when entering areas with human enemies, because when you do so, stealth is a viable option for play. Something about Burning Shores is the way it actually encourages stealth in a lot of its missions, which I found to be really interesting. Forbidden West doesn't have a crazy in-depth stealth system or anything, it's very bare bones, but it does have places to hide, detection meters, stealth takedowns from various positions, and the ability to tag enemies and highlight their patrol path. These elements together create what is actually a decently fun system to play around with. Like I said, not deep by any means, but fun, and that's pretty good for a game that isn't a stealth game, especially when games like Assassin's Creed can't even seem to get it right. Using rocks to move enemies around and allowing brief detection to coax soldiers over to you helps to keep you feeling proactive in dealing with particular scenarios. The most annoying thing though is that despite stealth only being viable with melee attacks due to the armor of human enemies now, not every stealth kill will be a surefire kill. Thankfully, the game will warn you by having a skull when it'll be a kill, or no skull when it'll just be a stealth attack, but I've always felt that if you're bringing levels into account when engaging with stealth takedowns, it can negate the entire system, because now stealth is not a completely viable option with which to engage, or because my level is a bit too low. Stealth should be a way to bypass levels. If you're skilled enough, you should be able to beat a particular section just by hiding and taking everyone out unseen, even if you're 50 levels underleveled, because that's the reward for being good. Sure, it shouldn't apply to machines because that's a little bit silly, but for human enemies, I think it should. Otherwise, 
What's the point? It doesn't feel very fun to sneak through an area and up to a guy just to be told, Nope, you can't stealth kill him. If you attack, you'll alert everyone. It feels a bit like a stab in the back. <laughs> I didn't even mean for that fun. It feels a bit like a stab in the back for thinking stealth would be a viable means of play, especially when Aloy will often say aloud, Let's try and take them out quietly. Maybe we can take them out quietly. Let's get this done! Thankfully though, the stealth kills do work like 95% of the time, assuming you're keeping on top of your levels and gear, so it's not a major issue, just an issue worth mentioning. And with the focus on stealth seeming to heighten in Burning Shores, it'll be interesting to see if they play into this more in the third entry. New skills though are introduced in Burning Shores, and I'm aware I glossed over the skill tree a lot in my original Forbidden West video. I had a few comments that weren't too happy about that. And while I do agree I did sort of completely gloss over it, I've never really found analyzing skill trees to be all that fun, unless I have something genuinely interesting to say about them. That said, however, Burning Shores adds two new skills to each tree, as well as a Valor Surge for each, which is a decent amount of stuff to work your way through and try out. And some were genuinely very nice additions that I felt enhanced gameplay, with things like being able to grapple launch from flying mounts, to crafting drop shields, grappling to down machines for a critical hit and resonator blast, healing from smoke bombs, or just some new combo moves for melee combat. It felt like they really worked to create new skills that allowed for necessary and interesting additions to general gameplay, in ways that I didn't realize I needed, but definitely made the game more fun to play. All in all with the gameplay, it sort of feels like, to me, they were expanding on certain elements, pulling back on others, and just sort of experimenting with concepts. It doesn't differ too much from the base game, but it does add elements that just help to make it feel more fun. I don't really have any major criticisms, just the few things that I outlined here that could be worked on moving forward. Or they could not, I mean, at the end of the day, I am just some guy. The world of Horizon is always exciting. Visiting new places and seeing what they can do to enhance the lore and world building, and while Burning Shores is absolutely no exception to that, I can't say the actual world space itself is all that interesting as a place to explore. I felt the map was small, restrictive, and a little samey. It's all just these islands separated by water which you spend a lot of time flying around in, and if you decide to navigate by land, there isn't a whole lot to see but just some old buildings and some trees, with only one major settlement in this region being a makeshift camp for the Quen in Fleet's End. One of the additions to the navigation I did like though was the skiff. Being able to zoom around on the sea with a boat is actually really fun and it did give me a sense of adventure and discovery as I moved around, but it was never the most efficient and after a while I took just flying everywhere because it was so much easier and faster, which is a shame. But that is always going to happen when you have such an easily accessible means to fly in a video game. Why would I take the slower option if I can get there 10 times faster by calling a bird and hopping on its back? The interesting part of this world design though is the way it attempts to remedy an issue that it was heavily criticized for on release. The exploration and discovery of things. In Forbidden West and Zero Dawn, you explore in a Ubisoft fashion. You find towers which unfog the map. Obviously, in Horizon, they're these moving tall necks, and Forbidden West adds a nice depth to each of them, giving them a unique task or mission to complete, which was really cool. But it's the same general idea. You complete a tall neck, it unfogs the map, and gives you question marks and locations, which you can then go off and complete. The game was criticized for this as it released alongside Elden Ring, a game lauded for its incredible sense of exploration and discovery, where nothing was marked on the map and you had to go off and find things which were lurking around every corner. And while I was personally more a fan of Horizon as a game, it's just sort of the thing that I lean into a bit more, it's hard to deny how compelling an open world like Elden Ring is by design, and Burning Shores does its best to course correct in a way that I don't actually think is favorable to the game. There is no tall neck in Burning Shores not a single one, so there is no way to automatically unfog the map, which forces you, if you want to complete everything, to explore, which on paper sounds pretty good. It removes the question mark dilemma and says, go off and find stuff, a lot of which isn't even marked on the map when you get close. There's a whole quest in which you discover the remnants of Osirum Delvers that aren't marked on the map. You have to explore to find them. The thing with this is, where Elden Ring never treats anything as a checklist or a collectible or a must-complete thing, 
Horizon does. It's still built like a checklist open world, but now you have no real way to track any of the things you want to check off of your list, which leads to increased levels of tedium, not reduced ones. Rather than having six totally separate and unique locations to find just by exploring, which offer valuable rewards or stories or lore, they have quest chains that require you to discover six connected black box signals, for example, all of which together lead you to a final quest which pays off the journey. But by not marking these on the map, it means you're not just organically finding these one-off engaging locations that have disconnected, it means you're actually scouring high and low for hours to try and find the last goddamn black box so you can finish this quest and complete this side story, and it's not fun. It's absolutely not fun. If you're going to design a world to be traversed like Elden Ring, the content has to reflect that means of exploration too. Elden Ring works because the fundamentals of the content you're engaging with has been built to work under the design philosophy of zero map markers. Horizon isn't. The content is all the same as it's ever been, they just removed the means of which to track things, leaving you with your nose to the ground scrounging for scraps to complete a quest that doesn't even give you much worthwhile substance as a reward. This is the fatal flaw of how Burning Shores designed its world. They tried to address criticism, but they didn't go far enough, and simply made it much worse. I'll parrot what I said in my original Forbidden West video. I simply feel what happens at the location in Horizon is infinitely better than actually finding the location itself. And in a game where story and character is paramount, that makes sense. In a game like Elden Ring, where the entire focus is pretty much gameplay oriented, marking things on your map would really, really simplify the entire game and break the entire design philosophy. The existence of Elden Ring doesn't make Horizon bad, they both just try to do different things, and that's okay. If you're following after Elden Ring, you need to do the whole shebang, otherwise do what you're good at and perfect that system. The world isn't all bad though, as I may have just led you to believe I feel. Not at all, there is plenty of merit here and plenty to actually discover. Little voice notes that add to the context of the story or little messages either from the old world to give you a bigger picture of Los Angeles, or notes from other adventurers and delvers who came to this place from Aloy's time. In classic Horizon fashion, it's all engaging and interesting when you stumble across these things. The Quen are also given plenty more depth, and we receive little hints to the state of the Empire across the sea, something I'd really love to see in the third entry. There's more to the Quen, but it'll all be a bit more relevant when we discuss story in a little bit. One of the key parts that makes Horizon's world so interesting is the diverse nature of its people. Horizon purposefully works into its lore a way for all tribes to have all manner of races and ethnicities, and it's something I've always found very admirable. Because not only does it allow for a diverse cast, it also manages to speak to how humans form prejudice and have a minor commentary on the world that we live in. There is prejudice in Horizon's world, plenty of it. The red raids of the Kaja, the fact Aloy was outcast, and the nature of relations between different tribes is proof of that. But there is no racism in Horizon's world, no homophobia. The reason for that being the Eleuthia Cradles. The people on Zero Dawn in-universe, namely Elizabeth Sobek, made sure the Eleuthia Birthing Cradles contained equal DNA from all peoples across the world, which is why every single tribe has people of all ethnicities. But what this shows is that when growing up around all different races, there's no reason ever for racism based on skin colour to exist. The only prejudice is based on culture, not appearance. This speaks to a nature of humanity that exists in reality. All prejudice comes from a place of fear of the unknown, or of change, or of an altering to the status quo that you feel comfortable in. By the nature of Horizon's world being designed the way that it is, it allows for us to reflect on why our world has particular prejudices. It makes the point that all prejudice is based in a foundation of absolutely nothing but fear of something different, and that we, as a people, have to confront that and fight back against that odd gut reaction that we can sometimes have to things we are unfamiliar with. And I think that's just really nice as a piece of world building that isn't often touched upon by the game itself. That was all really just an elaborate setup for me to say I noticed an NPC with Vitiligo and I thought it was pretty cool. I don't know if there's NPCs like this in the main game, but I never noticed it, so I'm going to assume the DLC added this, which I think is really cool. I like seeing them continue this trend of showing all kinds of different people. I think it's something intrinsic to Horizon's world building. The actual side content itself though is a good time. Some of it is of course better than others, like I mentioned, finding a Delver's treasure via six unmarked locations is not that fun, especially when the reward is almost nothing worthwhile. But despite the black box flight path things being a bitch to find, the reward was decent enough. 
Each one of these things gives you a recording from a woman who served during Operation Enduring Victory. By following the flight path for each, it reveals more of the story through audio logs. She discovered what was going on during Operation Enduring Victory, that it was a cover-up, and wanted to expose it to the world. But upon meeting Elizabeth, she was told the truth and understood, deleting her, I don't know, scheduled tweet or whatever, and helping the Zero Dawn team, because she understood the importance. It's actually a really tragic story of loss and despair, but also of the brief light of hope that Zero Dawn allowed for. Every one of these also gives you a little glimpse into the past during the final battle against the machines, seeing LA burning and crumbling. I actually really like this whole mini story. I thought it was genuinely quite moving and worked to flesh out an element of Horizon's history from the perspective of someone who had to experience it firsthand and lose people that they cared about. There were other unique things to discover, like the Stormbird malfunctioning and causing clouds to form over a specific island, flying above into the clouds which have been designed to really exist in this DLC, which is nice when you're flying around so much. You catch up with it and engage in a fight which leads you to some more collectibles and lore points, and it's just quite nice. Makes it feel organic and fun, and just another thing that's not actually marked on the map, but it's probably the best example of getting that right. This is Dino Digits. Yeah, so there's this game show thing at this theme park. You answer these different questions by collecting rare collectible dinosaur figurines that have these little info cards with them. After doing all of them, you get this little message from a character called Evelyn, who was an actress. She's in character as her character from the hollow that she was in. I found it all a little bit pointless. I don't know if I'm being too harsh here. Like, yeah, I guess it was a bit of fun, but like, I just didn't really give a shit. And on another note, why would Aloy even care about this? It doesn't feel like an activity that she would or even should be wasting her time with. All the dinosaur toys were pretty easy to find with some interesting elements of exploration to get a hold of them, but nothing too special. It was just sort of shallow and the reward didn't do anything for me, which is a shame. Horizon usually makes the rewards worth it. I just felt that this wasn't. I felt like I wasted my time more than anything, even if I did get a trophy. The DLC introduces more bandit camps. Fuck you. Moving on. There's a really nice cauldron here too. I almost didn't think there was one until I was just flying around and saw it carved into the side of a mountain and got all giddy. The navigation inside was unique and interesting, as well as this like little hover plate thing that moves depending on the bit that you're standing on. It reminded me a little bit of Arkham City when you have to use the grapple to pull the pallet over the water in the Iceberg Lounge. It's not even really similar at all, it just sort of reminded me of it. There were also some interesting uses of little water shoots. You had to like shoot these canisters out of these robots to create a shoot of water to get some air, and, and I thought that was creative, somewhat. Maybe a little janky in areas, but like, A forever, I think. The best part of the side stuff though are the side quests. Shocking, I know. They all play into the main story in one way or another, and although there are only literally three in the entire DLC, all of them felt valuable in one way or another for enhancing the focus of the core narrative. There's one I'll touch upon during the narrative section, but here I wanted to address the obvious fan favourite Gildan returning. Having him come back was a joy, one of my favourite characters from the Frozen Wilds, and after seeing his little note in the main game of Forbidden West, it made sense to stumble across him here in the Burning Shores. The quest itself offers an interesting set of puzzles to solve, which is always nice and I found it to be incredibly engaging, but the core of this is the character moment we get with Gildan at the end. Aloy being open now and wanting that support network, she reaches out to Gildan with a show of support that they'll always be friends and gives him a focus of his own, asking the guys back at the base to clue him in and help him out with learning the ropes. So here's to hoping we see more of Gildan in the third entry because he sure as hell deserves it. I like how this quest works as another way to explore Aloy's interactions with people after her Forbidden West arc. The way she embraces Gildan here is so kind and warm. It's just so nice to see how Aloy is with people after having this important self-discovery from the main game, and it just gets me excited for what's to come in the next major installment of Horizon. The main way though that they explore this is through the game's main story. I think we've beaten around the bush enough now, let's jump the fuck into the main narrative and character journey of Burning Shores. Spoilers will follow. The narrative is where I feel this DLC really shines, and I don't even necessarily mean through the bog standard storyline that's being told. I mean through the narrative subtleties that are explored and the character depth added by the events shared through our two central characters of Aloy 
and Seika. The main plot of the DLC is really just an excuse to get these two characters together. It starts with a message from Silence. Lance Reddick, the actor who portrays Silence, recently passed away, and so these interactions were that bit more emotional, especially after the ending of Forbidden West, in which we see a poignant character shift in Silence, staying behind to aid Aloy. The end of the DLC also leaves Silence on a very positive and interesting note, finally confessing that he's grateful of Aloy. The power balance shifted by the end of Forbidden West, and here you begin to see the start of what probably could have been a friendship, which is clearly what they were setting up. To have Silence and Aloy stand side by side as true allies by the end of the third entry. Who knows quite what they'll decide to do now, but one thing is for certain, and that's that Lance Reddick will be severely missed. Seeing his final performance here was a bittersweet closure. Aloy is told that the final Zenith that wasn't with the others from the main game has been located, a person named Walter Londra, portrayed by the incredible Sam Witwer. He's separated from the rest and is operating from within Los Angeles, known to the tribes as the Burning Shores. Aloy is tasked by Silence with heading to the Burning Shores and killing Londra, as well as searching for if Londra possibly has any information on how to combat Nemesis. Londra as a character isn't very complex. He's a relatively shallow villain. He's no Ted Pharaoh or even a Tilda, antagonists that are reasonably multifaceted. He's evil for evil's sake. He does evil things. He even seems to be aware that he's evil, and that's that. Similar to a lot of the main Zeniths from Forbidden West's main game, whose names I cannot remember because they're just that uninteresting. However, like from the main game, this all-evil, flat, one-note character allows for a story to unfold that directly affects our core characters. There is some nuance to Walter, although not a great deal. Over the course of the DLC, exploring different ruins and such, as you do in Horizon, you come across different voice notes and text logs that talk about or are from Walter himself, and they detail his early life on Earth before leaving with the Zeniths. He had a wife called Evelyn who was an actress in Hollows back in the day. She eventually left him for who he thought was his best friend, and this betrayal rocked him a great deal, as I'm sure it would any person. This sets the stage for his actions within the DLC. You discover by the end, Walter is using something called Microsoft Paint to control the minds of the Quen in the area. He wants to recreate his friendship circle from the old days, but through means that mean they will be entirely loyal to him, something he deeply cherished about his friends, or so-called friends from the old world. And so you can sort of see what they're doing here. The trauma of losing his wife to a friend, the backstabbing betrayal of that coupled with his already prominent greed and the thousands of years living alone with the Zeniths on their colony world, and it does give some nuance as to why he would go to such lengths when back on Earth. The issue I have with this is that, for one, it's presented through audio logs and data fragments, and so it's not something presented to us by the core story, or even something that the game necessarily wants us to be thinking about. It's totally sidelined bonus lore, rather than being of consequence to the actual narrative being told. Second though, Walter is still incredibly shallow as a character despite these additions. He's an evil corporate evil man doing evil things and showing no remorse at all, and while it makes him very easy to hate as an antagonist, A thousand years on, I feel like I can still smell her horrid little Shiba Inu. It's not very interesting or complex, and I just expect a bit more from Horizon in terms of its antagonist work. I really do hope that whatever they do with Nemesis in the third entry will work a means to build a nuance that is yet to be explored, because this DLC establishes AI as sometimes having more nuance than humanity itself. Nova, for example, can feel and empathise where Londra cannot. He forces Nova to tweak her empathy settings because she's able to feel for people where Londra isn't, and that's honestly quite chilling but I'm sort of over fighting evil things doing evil stuff for no reason other than programming or because they're just evil people and nothing else. Pharaoh was easily the most interesting antagonist and he's not even really an antagonist. I guess this is just something to consider when thinking about how Horizon uses opposing forces to Aloy. The great thing about Londra, though, is that despite his one-dimensional nature, how he's used to greater accentuate the development of Aloy is really, really well done. Aloy is someone who, at this stage, after her development, fights for the freedom of people. It's something touched upon multiple times throughout this DLC through different means, which I believe is the core theme here. 
Aloy believes in freedom above all else. She's had great experience with it. Being free is what allowed her to unite tribes in Zero Dawn, to discover what she needed to discover, and to accomplish her feats in Forbidden West. Freedom is the central reason for Aloy being as successful as she is, and after the events of Forbidden West and discovering her purpose for fighting, embracing what makes her different from Elizabeth and saving Beta, she now fights for that right to a freedom for all people. And Nemesis, of course, is the biggest threat to that, shackling this world to the failures of the old. The Quen are an empire, as we've been told by Alva in the main game, but it's explored again here in Burning Shores. Fleet's End is the camp made by the survivors of a storm just off the coast, and here the Quen work to rebuild, regroup, and make their way back home. What this allows for, though, is an exploration of their people deeper than we had in the main game, and it plays into this theme of freedom versus control. The Compliance are a sort of force of law in Quen culture, and they dictate the rules and regulations. The thing is, though, they're absolutely not a force of justice, more so a force of subjugation, which is about par for the course when it comes to any sort of law enforcement throughout all of human history. Yep, I, I reused that joke. I, I thought it was very funny. I wanted to get some mileage out of it. There are even side quests specifically about a rebel faction fighting back against the oppression of these compliance, which is talked about to be far, far worse back in the Empire. This is a core part of the journey of our secondary main focal character, Seika, a dedicated Quen Marine who has lost her sister when a large portion of their people went missing on the island. Seika is a free thinker. She doesn't sit back and do as she's told. She tries to use her own initiative to solve situations, and that comes from always feeling second best when compared to her sister, someone deeply respected by the higher ranks of their society. Of course, her and Aloy have a lot in common, but the key difference is that Aloy doesn't feel she has ties to the Nora, especially growing up there. They were never truly her family, as much as Ross desired it to be so. Her family are the friends she made along her journey, and now she has a place to call home, something she values, and something deeply worth fighting for. Seika discovers this freedom by spending the entirety of the DLC with Aloy, and the two become a lot closer for it. This central idea is mirrored in a line from one of the Hollows Londra's wife used to act in, the line being, how could I not come back? Being with you feels like belonging, it feels like home. A line that Walter is desperately trying to force onto his subjects in order to recreate the sense of bond he felt he had with Evelyn is something that naturally comes to Aloy and Seika by the end of the DLC. Freedom will always triumph and is always worth fighting for, as the rewards of being free are greater than anything that can be gained by subjugation or under submission. And like I said, this all sort of comes together in the central fight. Aloy's freedom versus Walter's control. It's kind of like Assassin's Creed. And all of these elements allow for a fantastic piece of character work to truly shine, Aloy's relationship to Seika. Over the course of the game, these two have various conversations with one another, getting to know each other and opening up in different ways. At first, I felt Seika was somewhat annoying, irritating, she rubbed me the wrong way a little bit for some reason. But as the DLC pushed on, I warmed to her more and more, and I realised that the reason I was irritated by her was potentially done on purpose. She was hiding herself behind this facade of quips and deflection, which made her appear shallow, until you scratch that surface and discover the person underneath, made to hide who she is, either by her people's judgement, or her shadow of her sister subconsciously pushing her down. Very similar to the Aloy we see in Zero Dawn, very deflective, very dismissive, and ignorant to her true nature that often shines through despite her attempts to hide it. Now that she's embraced her true self post Forbidden West, she can help Seika to do the same thing, and by the end what we've reached is such a perfect resolution, such a perfect character beat that I honestly shed a tear, not because it's deeply emotional, although it certainly is emotionally charged, but because this is the exact thing we needed to happen post Forbidden West, and it's something that I didn't even consider. I was too busy wondering about the spectacle, the next major story beat, the Horus fight and so on, that I couldn't even consider that what I needed most and what made the most sense was to have Aloy truly love for the first time, to find someone who makes her nervous, that makes her happy, that allows for the side of her that is the complete opposite of Elizabeth to shine through. Although the kiss itself is optional, Aloy's feelings for Seika are not. They're integral to her character growth, and it's just really lovely. After Forbidden West, the story which takes Aloy on a journey of self-discovery and acceptance of who she is, and of establishing a new groundwork within her for the love of people, having her find one person like this just fucking got me, man. This is perfect storytelling, and it proves again that Gorilla get this franchise, this character, and understand the central themes they want to explore with a deep certainty that only gets me excited for the third installment of the series. Also, fuck everyone for having a go at me, for saying that Aloy likes women in my Forbidden West video. I bet you all feel 
fucking stupid now, don't you? <laughs> and I wasn't originally going to address this, but I think I want to now because of the people that are seething and molding that this game is being too woke, that the existence of gay people is forcing diversity and that makes stories bad. Consider that everything within a story has to be determined prior to writing the story. Simply deciding you want your protagonist to be gay because you want to represent that in a story is a choice like any other. The same as choosing you want it to be in a post-apocalypse, or choosing you want to have robot dinosaurs. They also decided that they want Aloy to be gay. Choosing things isn't what makes a story bad. Writing badly is what makes a story bad. There are equally as many bad stories that are white, straight male-centric, but those aren't bad because they're about white, straight men, although I, I, I suppose some people do think that. They're bad because they're bad. Choosing to focus on an underrepresented demographic as a central pillar of your story isn't an inherently bad thing. In fact, I'd argue that it's a good thing. But like with absolutely any narrative idea or narrative focus, you have to execute it well. Some online personalities have just tricked a large amount of people into thinking that gay in media equals bad because woke, whatever the fuck that means based on a bad thing that was part of their favourite franchise that happened to also have some form of representation as minimal as a female lead. And um, people believe it. It's really sad, actually, because it negates genuinely interesting points of media criticism in favour of pointing at the woman or the minority and shouting, WOKE! <clears throat> sorry, with absolutely no actual critical substance. Woke as a term has been diluted beyond all substance at this point as well, and I look back at times that I used it, namely to describe the Saints Row reboot, and I regret it because of the connotations that word now carries. I should have used a different word to make my point. There's a great quote, actually, from one of the greatest British writers of all time, Russell T Davies, who also happens to be a gay man, who has told so many stories of gay characters, one of the best being It's a Sin, which is one of the best television programmes I've ever seen, period, in which he says, I do a lot of mentoring, and there are a lot of voices wanting to be heard, of any gender or ethnicity, who consider themselves invisible. They hate the media that ignores them, and they're trapped into wanting a job in that medium purely to increase representation. I read their scripts, and they're rubbish. They don't actually love television, so they don't know how to write for it. And what he's saying here is that a lot of the reason we get very poor displays of representation is because a lot of people wanting it haven't done the necessary legwork to understand and hone their writing craft. It's never representation itself that is bad, it's the poor understanding of writing that makes it bad. So when you see representation and immediately jump to, OH IT'S BAD! That's not really the correct reaction you should be having. I'm quite a big fan of analogies, so it'd sort of be like if you went to a restaurant and ordered a pizza, and it sucked, and you decided that pizzas suck. Which, th that's not true, is it? It was the restaurant that was bad at cooking that, that ma made it bad, not the recipe and the, the, the food itself. Right? You get what I'm saying? I didn't mean to go off on that tangent for so long, but it's something that has bothered me for a while now. I used to fall into that category. If you watch my stuff from 2016 to probably early 2019, I was very much in that boat of seeing representation and shouting, THING BAD! But it's such a silly and narrow way of approaching media and the criticism of media. I was originally here just going to make a joke about how people are being snowflakes because they can't handle any amount of gay, but I thought that would be pointless. It would be more valuable to actually try and make a point. I know people will hear this and not take any of it in. I'm sure there will be plenty of comments telling me to stay in my lane or keep politics out of my videos or whatever else. But it's relevant. It's always relevant. And it's worth talking about. And of course, if I talked about the opposite politics, if I lambasted the game for being woke, would the people saying keep out politics still be saying that? Or would they instead be behind me because I regurgitated the politics that they wanted me to? Because it's never about keeping politics out. It's about keeping the politics some people disagree with out. Anyway, Aloy and Seika are brilliant, and I love these two. I really hope to see her return in the third entry as a major supporting character because they had great chemistry and it was genuinely very, very fun. Once wrapping up the core story, we get an epilogue chapter, one which, like I said before, concludes Silence arc from Forbidden West very nicely, but also sets up what's to come next. Londra knew of several weapon manufacturers that 
could have developed weapons possible for fighting off Nemesis. It's a long shot, but it's something worth investigating. These companies are Ferro Automated Solutions, Metallurgic, Recorp, Certain T, and Gideon. Silence begins work on locating where they're located, and Aloy heads off to wrap up any side content which closes off our DLC. It's interesting, because this could suggest multiple things for the future of Horizon. Is it possible in the third entry we could get several smaller open worlds in different places around the globe where these weapon manufacturers are located, rather than one large open world in which they all exist? I'd kind of like that. For one final Horizon game to let us visit tons of places around the world, the remnants of London or Tokyo, maybe somewhere in Africa, Italy, Australia, it could be interesting to have four or five smaller open worlds to visit, sort of like how The Witcher has Velen, Skellige, Kaer and White Orchard and Tucson. I'd really be down for that, and while I'm not sure if that is their plan, it is certainly possible and it would be incredibly exciting. Only time will tell where they go with the next Horizon, but this DLC bodes very well for the future of the narrative in terms of what they've set up, but also for character consistency. They've got this, and they're certainly going to stick the landing with this trilogy. We can't end this video without talking about that damn Horus fight. It's pretty much exactly what I envisioned it would be like, and they nailed the spectacle. It was here where I understood exactly why this DLC only released on the PS5. The scale of the Metal Devil is just astronomical compared to anything we've fought before. The set piece as you parkour alongside it, making its way to the ocean in an attempt to catch up and stop it, dodging through its spider-like legs as you aim to take out its heatsink on the underside, the entire surroundings of you being destroyed and walls knocked down, from that to climbing up one of its legs with a well-timed glide, making your way up to the top to unveil another heatsink with your spear. The scale of the fight just continues to be topped. When I was climbing this thing, it was genuinely one of the more exciting moments in video games from recent memory. All of the pieces just came together to make a moment where I felt in control of doing something as awesome as this looked to pull off. From there, we face the Horus one-on-one -on -one in a makeshift arena as it traps you with its legs, dodging attacks and retaliating to damage the exposed elements of the Horus, eventually damaging the hull enough that it flees, causing us to give chase, diving underwater and swimming to catch up to the opened hull to make our way inside of this incredible beast. Once inside, the architecture is nothing like we've seen before, similar to a cauldron but far more mechanical, dark and foreboding, which I really love. The cauldrons have their own air of wonder to them, whereas the inside of the Horus feels confined, evil and hostile, especially with the added red lighting. Reaching the central chamber, we fight Londra, hooked up to the core of the Metal Devil, and here we have a basic yet very intuitive boss fight in which we dodge his oncoming attacks and use well-timed bow shots to destroy the core when the shield drops, until finally we can deactivate it, kill Londra, and escape with Seika. The Horus now in a different place on the map to where it originally was. The trail of our battle makes a mark on the world itself. This entire boss fight is utterly magnificent, like truly stands as maybe one of the best moments in any game I've ever played. It's flawless, it's thoughtful, and above all, it's simply fun. This feeling of being this tiny person tackling this huge and terrible beast, the only thing I can possibly liken it to in the way that it affects your perception as a player is the end of Mass Effect 1 when all of the ships team up to take down one single Reaper attacking the Citadel, but in this instance, you get to play it. You have to do it yourself, and it's a long stretch of gameplay too. All of this effort just to take down one single Horus. Imagine if Nemesis were to bring them all online. The devastation it would reap is unimaginable, which is what I think this fight allows you to conceptualize. You understand how tough it was to take down one of these, one that was damaged and not fully operational yet. Imagine hundreds of fully operational Metal Devils all across the world. Is that something you could even conceivably fight against? It also helps to visualize what the final days of Operation Enduring Victory must have been like, with these things dominating the globe. You notice when fighting one that the sky turns a little bit grey, and the world feels darker. I'm sure with the hundreds and thousands of them, it would have been so much more bleak. This is one of my favourite boss fights. They absolutely nailed it, and I cannot wait to see how they outdo this, hopefully, in the third game. Give me something big to go out on. It's going to be very exciting. I got this video done in a lot less time than I originally anticipated, but I did speak about everything I wanted to talk about. 
The DLC itself is a lot smaller than I expected, and although that does feel underwhelming in some ways, and although I did sense some growing pains in its actual design philosophy after the heaps of criticism they suffered from Elden Ring's release, I do think the Heart of Horizon is still there, and they did so much to push forward this game into a direction that made so much sense narratively. I hope they perfect their design in the third entry, leaning less into what they think people want and more into what allows Horizon to shine, but only time will truly tell. All of this was overall a positive addition to the world of Horizon and to the story of Aloy, and I am deeply looking forward to whatever they decide to do next. Thank you all so much for joining me for this video. I, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed. I really do. Um, I really enjoyed Burning Shores. I thought it was great, despite the fact that there were some flaws with it. It wasn't perfect, and there were some parts that I found a little bit underwhelming. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. What did you think about Burning Shores? I'd be interested to have a conversation, a, an actual intelligent conversation about the substance of the game. If I see any comments, any comments talking about how Aloy's gay, so that's bad, I will block you. I literally will block- that's not- that's not a critical conversation and discussion about a piece of media. That's bullshit, and you're a fucking idiot. And I, w I will block you. I will. <laughs> I, I don't care. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate you checking out my Patreon, because it helps me create videos like this. I got some more big projects in the future, and I just put out a really big project recently. And the people supporting me on Patreon, I, I really couldn't do it without you. I mean, I probably would still do it without you, but God, it would be so much harder because you really do help support me monetarily. Over on Patreon, I put out early access, bonus content, plenty of extra stuff behind the scenes. Just so much. This, this, I do I do a ton on Patreon, so go give it a give it a look if you if you're interested. If you're interested even a little bit, go, just go have a little look. Might be something for you. And of course, I've got to thank my Patreon producers as always. I mean, uh, <laughs> thank you to Ethan Arenathon. Flash Paradox, Connor Seedor Sam is paying James's water bill, Cabbage, and Damien the Not So Orange Gnome. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a nice day, morning, evening, night, wherever you might be. And uh, I'll catch you soon for another video on something else. Another topic. It might be Jedi Survivor. I don't know. It depends. I'm going to play it and I'm going to see if I think like it was really good. Because I know I did a video on Jedi Fallen Order back in 2019. It's not a great video. Don't watch it. But I, but I did think, like, if it's good, maybe I'll make a critique of, of Jedi Survivor or something and, and talk about, you know, why it was good. If it's really bad, I mean, I could make a video on why it's really bad, but it doesn't look like it's going to be really bad, so um, there's that. If it's just sort of middling and just kind of fun, I might just not make a video and just move on to something else. I don't know. We'll see. And that's it. I'll catch you next time, everybody. Bye-bye.